Hello everyone in the Still Point Spaces community. I'm Dr. Kevin Liu. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to have been invited by Aaron and his team to present the first topic in our series on psychology in culture. Now, true to the ethos of Still Point Spaces, we want to show through these topical discussions the applicability and utility of depth psychological insights when they are applied to the products of culture and mobilized to understand the world around us and the pressing issues of our time. Now, what we'll always aim to do is to create a safe space for exploration and discussion. So without further ado, let's start this first session together. And today we're looking at the Netflix phenomenon, Squid Game. Now this series literally came out of nowhere. Well, it didn't come out of nowhere, but it just came and, and dominated so quickly. The creator and director, Huang Dong Hyuk, originally wrote the series in 2009, but didn't grab the interest of production companies until 2019. There are some definite precursors. I'm instantly reminded of the Japanese manga and book turned cult movie uh, made in 2009, Battle Royale, where a group of students is chosen every year to play a deadly survival game on a remote island. Ultimately, there can only be one winner and the game is set up as a way for adults to control the unruly nature of youth culture. The other precursor that comes to mind is the American novel series, also turned into a series of films, The Hunger Games. Watching the series also reminded me of several films. Bong Joon-ho's Oscar-winning Parasite 2019 comes to mind, as well as his underappreciated 2013 film Snowpiercer. I was also reminded of J.G. Ballard's High Rise, which was adapted to the silver screen in 2015. What connects all these films is the focus on issues of class. Indeed, in the conversation, colleagues have elected to focus on this particular aspect of Squid Game. Sarah A. Son writes about the household debt crisis affecting the lower and middle classes. There is rising debt relative to income that is only exacerbated by a recent hike in interest rates. A curb in borrowing means that more people are turning to higher risk lenders. Matt Bennett suggests that the series may be best understood as a critique of meritocracy. Now meritocracy has it that success is not determined by class, race, age, or gender. The better you are, the harder you work, the better your financial position in life. Indeed, the front man provides a rather twisted speech about the game's intention to level the playing field so that everyone has a fair chance, something that is not the case out there in the real world. But as Bennett rightly notes, the same social factors shaping inequality out there in the real world are mirrored and repeated in the game itself. Factions form, women are shunned, and elderly players are abandoned. Paying attention to class and the dynamics of social forces are indeed warranted because they are at the heart of director Huang Dong-hyuk's motivation for creating the story. But with the lens of depth psychology firmly in place, we're very aware that there are several ways to approach and deepen our understanding of art. One way to understand art and the products of culture is through authorial intention. But this might reduce the art to a psychology of the artist or creator. Perhaps it would also be instructive and fitting if we asked what the series and its popularity might say about those consuming it. In the relational matrix between viewer and viewed, what is stirred in the unconscious of individuals and collectives? Why are we so attracted to particular programs and what potential voids do they fill when we enjoy and consume these products? And what are we betraying, both about ourselves and the societies we live in, when the status of a cultural product reaches the heights that Squid Game has achieved? Now, two things came to mind, and these are just broad ideas, and I'm gonna throw some ideas out there. 
which we'll then discuss more fully during our synchronous discussion. And remember, if you want to have access to this live community, please contact our colleagues at Still Point Spaces for more information. And I've put the email up on this slide here, hello at stillpoint.org. So as I mentioned previously, two big ideas or two major points came to mind. So first um, is that economics is psychological. And the second theme or trend I noticed is the constellation of the child archetype, which is an idea stemming from the psychology of C.G. Jung. So let's start with the relationship between psychology and economics. Contrary to what many might believe, a discussion about economic equality cannot exclude the psychological because, as Andrew Samuels argues in 2014, disputes about human nature ultimately underpin our understanding of economics. The societies we live in, how they operate and how its citizens are treated have an impact on our psychology. People are suffering and dying because of economic deprivation. Now, I won't go into details about the paper, but there's um, a really interesting point that I want to raise here and I want to highlight. Um, and that is that there is a potential relationship between class and an individual's inner world. And regardless of how high we might climb in life financially, regardless of how much better we do economically in relation to our parents, the social class we are brought up in is the social class we're stuck in. And there's a great example of this in Squid Game. But before I continue, I just want uh, to, to say that this is a spoiler, alert, a spoiler alert because I will be delving into some of the details of the show. Even after winning the game, player 456, Seong Gi Hun, can't bring himself to spend any of the money for over a year. He's still horrified and traumatized by the way in which the game and the situation it created gave rise to the worst in human nature. Although his fantasies about what he would do with the money were vivid and clear at the outset, that he would get his daughter back, pay for his mother's operation, etc. Once he gets it, he still lives like he did previously until he is shaken out of his indifference, his hope in humanity rekindled. Now, there are obvious reasons why Seong Gi-hun remains in this frozen state, but the idea that there may be psychodynamic barriers to social mobility is certainly one worth further discussion and consideration. Now, why might audiences be drawn to Squid Game from a psychological perspective? Well, it provides an opportunity and safe space for us to fantasize about what we would do with the money, how we would win the games without actually getting our hands dirty and suffering the ethical and moral consequences. In other words, it's an invitation to indulge in what Andrew Samuels calls economic sadism. He writes, most people have pretty nasty fantasies in the money zone, fantasies of getting rid of rivals, attaining superiority, eliminating awkward othernesses whenever they are encountered. In analysis, some, but surely not all of this, may emerge in the transference. But perhaps there is an ineluctable cruelty attached to money, and this may be one area where tragic vision is all we can muster. Humans love their inequalities, and that is that. What Andrew is getting at here in Jungian terms, is owning the shadow. Jung writes, when one tries to be good and wonderful and perfect, then all the more the shadow develops a definite will. People cannot see that. They are always striving to be marvelous, and then they discover that terrible, destructive things happen which they cannot understand, and they either deny that such facts have anything to do with them, or they try to minimize them and to shift the responsibility elsewhere. In other words, the economic sadism, the violence, the betrayal that we see in Squid Game, we're capable of this. 
just as we get to witness the economic fantasies of some of the players and the lengths to which they would go to achieve them, we're also witnessing aspects of ourselves. And it might give us pause and compel us to reflect on the shameful things we might do to secure financial success. What Squid Game does really well, at least from a psychological perspective, is to show us a tension of opposites, the energy that arises between economic ruthlessness and compassion. Indeed, there are moments of compassion and humanity. When player 67, Kang Se Byuk, reminds player 456 of his better nature, and that he did not want to win the game by killing his friend, player 218, Cho Sang Wu, before the final game. We see it when Seong Gi Hon, who has effectively won the last game, invokes a rule to allow both players to live, but would mean that he forfeits the 45.6 billion cash prize. And we see it when Seong Gi Hon's friend, whose desire to win at any cost is palpable throughout the entire series, sacrifices himself so that Seong gi Hun wins, thereby enacting some form of reparation for his misdeeds. Another reason why I think the show is so popular is because it's saying something about childhood, what our expectations of childhood are, and what happens when we fail to achieve this ideal. There's something ominous about the complete reversal of expectations. We expect children to play, to enjoy themselves, to be carefree. At one level, the series is showing us how we fall short of this ideal when children live in economic depravity. Player 456 can't take care of himself and his mother, let alone his daughter, who lives with her mother, stepfather, and stepbrother. Player 67, who has escaped from North Korea with her brother, is single-mindedly focused on taking care of her brother and getting him out of the orphanage he's in. Abdul Ali, a migrant worker from Pakistan, will do anything to provide for his wife and young child. And indeed, the tagline for the show is 45.6 billion won is child's play. Yet these games come with a high cost. If you lose, you just don't lose a turn or sit out, you die. You pay with your life. The stakes are higher than we could possibly imagine. Another way to explore this interest in childhood is through what Jung calls the child archetype, or more specifically, the energy or themes that are constellated when this archetype becomes active and mobilized. So what is the potential symbolic meaning when narratives of childhood are evoked? First, there is a certain vitality and energy associated with the constellation of the child archetype. Think of the phrase childlike enthusiasm. And anyone who has interacted with kids know that most have a lot of energy and it's tough to keep up. So there's something about renewal, rejuvenation and rebirth a newness of unbound potential, a new energy that can propel us in directions we never thought possible. When the child archetype is constellated in dreams, it often denotes a fresh start, being at the beginning of a new stage or process. It's not surprising then that Jung makes a connection between the appearance of the child archetype and the process of individuation. And he writes, but the clearest and most significant manifestation of the child motif in the therapy of the neuroses is in the maturation process of the personality induced by the analysis of the unconscious, which I have termed the process of individuation. So it's not surprising, given that one of the most revered archetypal images of the child archetype is the Christ child. And as Jung and several Jungians have articulated, the life of Christ constitutes one example of how life can be lived with integrity, i.e. as a quintessential representation of the individuation process. The child in myth is usually a wonder child, a divine child begotten, born, 
and brought up in extraordinary circumstances. The child may present as lowly in stature or in status, but ultimately has the potential to become and to realize its fullest potential. There's also a recurring motif of abandonment, or at the very least, a threat to the child's existence. And here I'm reminded of Moses and Hephaestus. Psychologically, the theme of abandonment points to insignificance, exposure, danger, and shows how precarious the psychic possibility of wholeness actually is. It also reminds us of the enormous difficulties to be met with attaining self-knowledge. We can all too often abandon the quest for ease of an unexamined life. Abandonment reminds us of the obstacles to individuation. Now, there seems to be a seeming contradiction. The child is divine, but also lowly and under threat, smaller than small, yet bigger than big. Now, this is related to the theme of paradox. And indeed, paradox is the essence of the hero child. The child comes from humble beginnings, but has the potential of achieving the greatest deeds that can benefit society. And it's also encapsulated in the symbol of the hermaphrodite, a symbol of the archetypal self, transcending all oppositions and overcoming well-worn labels, i.e. between masculine and feminine. There is also a future thrust or a forward movement, if you will, to the archetype of the child. And Jung refers to this as the futurity of the archetype. It points to our greatest potential. It gives us hope, a fighting chance of progressing along the path of individuation as we press forward in our respective lives. In dreams, the appearance of the child often denotes a new beginning of a separation from a conflict laden situation. It denotes the start of a new phase or a new opportunity. It points to the potential for individuation guided by the telos, i.e. the future looking aspect of the archetypal self, the end goal and impetus to the journey of individuation. Above all else, the child archetype expresses our potential for wholeness. The child is all that is abandoned and exposed, and at the same time, divinely powerful, the insignificant, dubious beginning, but also the triumphal end. And arguably, we see these themes operating and circulating at some level in Squid Game. All the participants are down and out in some way. All of them are in need of, and are in search of, redemption, to change their lot, to enact a complete reversal of fortunes through, ironically, play, and in particular, playing quote-unquote childish games. Now, the ultimate prize? Yes, in one sense, it's money. But psychologically, it would be what Jung referred to as the treasure hard to attain. That there's some psychological gold, some psychological prize at the end of this process. And ultimately, all the participants yearn for and fantasize about a better future. They are forward-looking, trying to imagine a life free from the respective problems they face. Player 456 is ultimately a good person. He's a bit of a rascal who has fallen on hard times, but his heart is in the right place. He's a likable individual. At one level, the game offers an opportunity to change one's fortunes. Psychologically, you could say that the game represents a chance at transformation. It might be a catalyst to rebirth, both financially and psychologically. Now, it's important to note that I'm not reading the violence in this series as literal, but symbolic, a sort of psychological violence that is done to the psyche and that it experiences on the path of transformation and change. At the end, player 456 is certainly impacted by the game, of life perhaps, that he has just experienced and in which he has consciously participated. It hasn't been easy, 
There have been losses, there have been tears, and there have been sacrifices. But he does emerge a little more conscious and, I would say, a little more socially aware and attentive to how individual growth is intertwined with an awareness of the economic aspects of our psyche. And he emerges a changed man, with flaming red hair to boot. He's a little more tempered and pensive, a bit more aggressive and assertive, which in measures can be a good thing, and aware of right and wrong. Individuation doesn't always lead to achieving some guru-like status. There's a banality and normality to achieving greater self-awareness. What this show does so well is to remind us that our fantasies of a better life and a better version of who we are aren't always what we hoped for or imagined. Sometimes it just might mean finding that balance between what Andrew Samuels has called economic sadism and economic compassion. And in those spaces in between, we might just find out who we are. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I look forward to seeing everyone at our discussion, the details of which will be on the Still Point Spaces website. And again, if you want more information about how to access the community and even more content and to get direct access to myself and other professionals within the community, um, just ping us a message and at this particular email address and we'll get right back to you.